Uh, first, I just want to thank everybody for coming uh, again to another week of our virtual Grand Rounds. Um, we have a, you know, a good friend and, and, and our guest uh, from New York, uh, Dr. Jack Chaffee, uh, who's the chair of ophthalmology at Columbia and also the president of the Columbia University Physicians Group um, for the medical, uh, the medical school. Uh, so I think that, you know, for all of us in Chicago, thanks for joining us. And I think that um, you know, we can learn a lot from what you've been experiencing. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, Dr. Chaffee will present for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, and then he's uh, going to stay for about another 40, 45 minutes to answer any questions um, until about 6.30 our time. Um, Obviously, we're, we're using Zoom, um, so uh, during the question and answer, if what you could do is just raise your hand, and I'll help uh, just navigate and uh, and call on you know people as they as they start to raise their hand for for any questions for Dr. Chaffee. Uh, so, Dr. Chaffee, I'm going to leave it to you now. Great, and thanks, Paul, for the invitation, and hi to a lot of uh, friends. And sorry, we're all going through this. Um, so what uh, I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about our experience. Uh, and I changed the subtitle here a little bit because really it's about, it's, it's morphed over time. I'm going to talk about that phased approach that, that I mentioned in the first subtitle. But it's really about managing data, a bit about managing uncertainty, and then trying to manage expectations uh, for ourselves and our employees. So here are the six topics I'm gonna to go over. And actually, let me go back for one sec. I like this picture because it, it's a true picture. It's a juxtaposition of the new Vagilos uh, Education Center, the mainstay of uh, Columbia's uh, med school. Uh, but it's in a neighborhood that uh, things like social distancing and, and stay at home orders are difficult. And it just, uh, you know, like your own city, uh, there's nooks and crannies that all the uh, good intentions don't always work in. Okay, so the six topics. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what I call the phased approach. And uh, uh, you'll, you'll see, I'll walk you through how we've been thinking about it. I'm gonna urge you to enlist experts and gather data uh, as you go along. And I'm sure you're already doing that, but I'm gonna list some of the experts and talk about how we gathered our data uh, early on. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, guiding principle setups, which we've done a couple times now, and we'll do a third time uh, shortly. Uh, I'm going to talk about acknowledging uncertainties and the fears, and and this is all over the map, depending on what your group, who's contained in your group, and uh, and it's different for a physician versus a front desk person versus a technician. Talk about how we created our plan and how we commute, communicate our expectations. And finally, you know, I've been urging everybody to find some good dividends. So make something good happen out of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on what that is. Okay, so here's the setup. And uh, Paul, is it clear? Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, so here's the setup, and I'll refer back to this chart, but let me sort of walk you through how we've been thinking about it. You know, back in December and February, uh, we were in a so-called pre-COVID uh, condition. You know, I will tell you there's a publication from David Ho's group, the virologist uh, who did all the AIDS research, HIV research, came up with the cocktail. He was time man of the year uh, at some point. He's on our campus since the beginning of the year and he's been testing blood samples and there's a New England Journal article that will either publish tonight or tomorrow probably uh, where he shows that it was in our community uh, at least 5% of our community back in uh, January and February uh, from serology uh, samples that had been uh, uh, housed uh, that he went back and tested once we had serology testing up and running. So he estimates that tens of thousands of people in New York uh, had it prior to the first identification and probably the same is true in your community. Phase one is, is that peak phase it's where the tsunami's coming and we're trying to figure out how to deal with it. And that's, you'll see in some data in a second, that's abating now and we're about to head into what we're calling phase two, but we break phase two into to two separate things. Phase two A is really the 
May, June timeframe. And that's where we've got to turn some systems back on while still having lots of COVID positive patients. And you'll see some of the numbers shortly. Phase 2B is, is in my mind, the summer, maybe bleeding into September and October for us. And all these, you know, there's a phase shift here for, for you guys because you're a few weeks to a month behind us, but uh, it's going to linger for a while. That phase two is when there's a lot of COVID still out there, a lot of COVID still in our uh, hospitals, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal in that environment. And then phase three, which I'll only touch on briefly because there's too many unknowns to touch on it more completely than that but we'll talk a little bit about sort of that new reality or new normal or whatever uh, silly term you wanna apply. I'd urge you that you don't have to plan for every one of these right off the bat. And uh, uh, Jeff Liebman's online and our vice chair and, and he and I back in February, we're trying to plan the whole you know, rest of our career out uh, when this was hitting. And I'd urge you not to do that. And actually it was, it was our dean that talked me down off the ledge to say, you know, focus on the next phase and, and then prepare for the next phase. And while he might not have gone as fast as I would have liked to go, uh, I think it was good advice because there's just too many unknowns and you can't, you can't plan for every eventuality. So, so take it a phase at a time. Okay, so here's a little reality check. I went back and just looked through my emails for when I first got the first email about COVID and when I actually started paying attention. So that, there's an actual email up there and it was uh, the 21st of, of January this year. And that was 10 days before our campus went big bang live on Epic. So complicating matters uh, to say the least, we were very focused on a lot of things. And in our department, we were frankly going from paper to Epic. We were scan based. We did a little bit of electronic medical record, but we had a big leap. So I can't tell you that I was paying attention at all to COVID when I got that first email. And it was about the first case in, in uh, Washington state. That was followed though, uh, four days later when uh, Nick Homa, our CMO, who works for me in the uh, faculty practice, came to me and said, we really got to get some information out about COVID. And I, I, I talked with him today. I basically blew him off. I said, you know, I, all I can think about is Epic and uh, you, you want to send something out, send something out. And he sent an announcement out, say, we got to start thinking about this. And, um, and that was that. I, I didn't even participate in that. Uh, again, we went live on, on February 1st, but it was the day that our provost sent out the first travel restrictions for our campus and started to lock down. And a lot of people look, frankly, at it oddly. What do you mean I can't travel to Europe? What do, what do you mean we're gonna uh, uh, prohibit uh, out-of-country travel uh, for all of uh, Columbia University? There's a lot of pushback. Honestly, we went into that little coma for those of you that have gone uh, through an epic uh, go live for a couple of weeks and there was very little attention paid, not only by our department and by myself, but uh, by our uh, university. But around the 14th, a couple of weeks later, we started getting an increasing email traffic. There started to be more and more cases. And then the new Rochelle case uh, came out, which is exactly 3.3 miles from where I'm sitting right now in Westchester County and became an epicenter. And it was estimated that that single individual through community and uh, uh, synagogue touches had a touch with thousands of people. But we know now that uh, from David Ho's data uh, that it was, it was already in the community. He was just the first to surface. It's actually done well, by the way, uh, was at Columbia for quite a while. So what did we do? What did we do in those first uh, days to weeks as we were grappling with this? Actually, the first thing we did was we set up a leadership team. And to this day, 1030 every morning for the first five or six weeks, it was seven days a week. Uh, Jeff Liebman, Bonnie uh, Wang, who's our uh, departmental administrator and a very talented person. And then uh, Daniel Tracy, uh, who's actually a son of an ophthalmologist and is our uh, lead, he, he runs all of our clinics. 
we meet every day at 1030. And that leadership teams, we, we, we got used to uh, Microsoft Teams, which we had used almost none at all uh, to that point, but we had in place. And we discuss all sorts of things. But in that first week of March, we set up sort of our, our primary objective, our, our first guiding principle. And that was that we were gonna keep patients, faculty and staff as safe as we can. And that played off something that I'll get to in a second. We also developed this running list of concerns, rumors, all sorts of things from, and I just listed a few here, but everything that came to one of us or we heard or we had interactions with, we kept this running list. And today uh, at our 1030 meeting, uh, Dr. Liebman again brought up, okay, we gotta get back to the list. And we keep that just to remind ourselves, oh yeah, we gotta make sure you know we're, we're meeting uh, the needs of our, our staff and such. And it's all over the map from job insecurity to frankly food insecurity to other things. This next thing I can't uh, overemphasize enough. And that is we, we really started to get schooled. And we got schooled primarily initially by our uh, infection prevention and control folks, uh, Scott Hammer, David who I mentioned, but Magda Sovietic, uh, who's the head, and I'll come back to her in a second, we, we involved her a lot in those first weeks, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But also our administration, uh, public health school that's here, data analytics groups, and we took advantage of a, long, a large group of folks across the campus that many of you have at your own campuses, and I'd urge you to reach out. Because, you know, I, I didn't know really any of the uh, infection control. I knew Scott Hammer a little bit. Uh, I had met David Ho. But, uh, you know, we talk with them multiple times a week now. The next thing that happened was uh, one of our trustee members, uh, a guy named Li Lu, who's a finance guy who has a lot of dealings in, in China and is, uh, is, is Chinese himself, uh, was uh, set up this worldwide uh, teleconference. And Jeff and I attended that teleconference back on the 13th of March. And it's actually, if you, if you just look up his name, you can get it, the, the uh, recording of that. And about a dozen health systems across the country uh, participated in that. And there, there were a few great, there, were, there was the ICU director from Wuhan. Uh, there was a VP from a, a huge hospital. There was an ID director from Shanghai who had a much different experience. Uh, with this, but there were a few messages there. One was that there was already an evolving literature. It's where we first were introduced to the idea that ophthalmologists may be disproportionately affected by this. Uh, that came out of the Wuhan data very early on, but also the, the message came that uh, uh, community prevention strategies really work. And I think what it converted Jeff and I and consequently our department into were hawks about this and we started pushing hard. Uh, so that, that was on the, the 13th, the week before we had done some data gathering and I'll, I'll come back to that. But I think this really solidified it for us and it's when we started shutting down and, and tightening up. Then the data aggregation, and I, I know that probably all your systems and, and frankly Hopkins, as you've all watched the, the Hopkins maps evolve from their uh, public health uh, center uh, is great but I also think you have to do it at a local uh, level. And, and we, you know, we started with basic simple tabulation. Uh, we went to trending and here it is on the uprise in those first weeks, uh, the second, third and fourth uh, weeks of, uh, of March coming into April. There's our peak. Uh, and the, the three lines here, the top one is total uh, COVID patients in our system, which topped out at about 2,600 patients. This is across all of New York Presbyterians, eight hospitals, including our own. But those, look at those other scary lines, the ICU and ventilated uh, patients. And also notice how slowly they're eroding. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. These, these patients went from ICU stays where they weren't doing very well at first of a few days to a week to two weeks. Now the average ICU stay and ventilation is around 20 days. So about three weeks. So that number erodes much more slowly. 
We also did both locally, actually Jeff was the first to do this in our department, Gus de Moraes in our department, but then system-wide, <clears throat> some predictive analytics. And we're playing off these, because now as we're thinking about reopening and, and claiming back, we have ICUs that popped up in the emergency room. We have ICUs in our, some of our ORs, not the IORs, but the uh, main ORs in the, the main house. Uh, we have to back those patients out before we can start using those ORs, before we can get those ventilators back and such. And so we have to know the decay curve. And the decay in the ICU and ventilated patients is just slower. And our predictive modeling as a system has been almost spot on what's been going on. Uh, and, and so all I can tell you is once you get to that peak, uh, the, the downside is, is a lot slower. We were doubling at a rate of every about two days back in the end of March. It stretched out to 10 days, uh, two weeks, and then it, it, we flipped over the top. Let me get back to that phasing concept. And so we were in that pre-COVID, we we're getting ready, we we're gaining information, we we're schooling ourselves up, we we're meeting lots of new friends in, in infectious disease and uh, public health and such. And we were fearing uh, the fear peak here. Uh, it's not what we saw, but here's what the hospital did. The hospital said, we got to get ahead of this. And so as a system and as, as our own institution, we doubled the number of ICU beds with the ability to go up to triple. We did the same. We more than doubled the med surge beds. And uh, it was all in preparation for what could have been the fear of peak, but as the social distancing and stay at home and such worked, you know, that flattening of the curve really did happen. And it, but it, it does two things, right? It squashes the, the peak, but it also pushes it out a bit further. So it's slower to get to. And, you know, you saw in our real data that we got to it, but it pushed out further. We're also obviously worried about these reemergences as we go through the summer. And that's part of that phase two that we're concerned about. The hospital has, you know, uh, Steve Corwin, our hospital CEO, uh, who's a physician, he's a cardiologist, said, we will not be caught in this situation again. So they have made a commitment, and he's called it uh, counterintuitive investing, that we're going to have an enhanced capacity. We're going to have floors that, while they might not be ICUs all the time, they're ready for ICUs. So we're not building ICUs on the, on the fly and such. So they're doubling down uh, and, and it's a message to the rest of us. <clears throat> Here's what happened in clinical practices, not only our own and our own department, excuse me, <clears throat> but across the system. Virtually overnight, beginning in mid-March, we shut off the spigot. We, <clears throat> we actually, our department and then our institution was a little ahead of of both our governor and our mayor at shutting down uh, elective surgery. Uh, and when we shut down office visits, except for urgent and emergent, it happened that it, it went down very quickly. And it, it frankly went down to someplace between 10 and 20%. I'll give you a couple caveats on that. And it's a slow build back up, but really it's been hanging in that 10 to 20% range uh, now for the better part of a month month and a half. Okay, so I'll come back to the phases in a sec and what we did, but what I would urge all of you to do is figure out a communication strategy right now. Um, and I can tell you the thing that's paid the biggest bang for the buck isn't grand rounds, uh, is really these, uh, we call them town halls, virtual town halls. We've done, we'll do our seventh one tomorrow. And the very first one we did was with Magda, the director of, uh, of uh, infectious disease at Columbia. And she came in uh, on the 5th of uh, March. And it was, it was that I, I mentioned to Paul earlier, we set it up, I can't remember, for 150 people. And it was fully subscribed in you know, two minutes. <coughs> and she, gave, she just gave us information. We've had her back. We had her back last week to talk about testing and therapies and things. But really that first week was just an education 
and we open it up to everybody. We open it up to our faculty, our staff, uh, our nursing, uh, people that worked within the department, people that were ancillary to the department. And I really do think that uh, that's paid huge dividends for us. Subsequent to that, and I'll come back to this later, but we've had uh, our uh, vice chair of psychiatry speak about the uh, mental health aspects of this. Uh, tomorrow, we actually have an interesting one. Uh, annually, we do a ethics grand rounds around ophthalmic cases. And tomorrow just happened to be when Ken Prager, the head of uh, clinical ethics at Columbia was scheduled to give grand rounds. So this past weekend, uh, a group of us from the department asked him, hey, can we just make this all COVID related? So we're gonna cover topics uh, like uh, uh, delaying surgery, uh, the, cost, the potential cost of vision, uh, prioritization of restart and, and such, and even redeployment we're gonna talk about. Uh, you know, there's a little bit that I'm preaching to the choir here. I have down in the lower right hand uh, there, the magnificent uh, compendium that you guys put together at UIC, it's great. And, uh, you know, we exchanged, uh, Paul and our group exchanged some information early on. And now that you gave this back to us, you know, we're up in our game. So I think that's another communication vehicle. We do uh, a series of weekly updates that go out uh, nationally. Uh, we send stuff to the AAO. We really want it. We took the approach right off the bat that anything, any good idea we had was really had to be pushed out because we knew we were a bit ahead of everybody and we knew our tsunami was probably gonna be pretty large. We reopened Grand Rounds about three or four, after about three or four weeks of a hiatus where we were a bit overwhelmed, uh, but we've been doing Grand Rounds over the month. And as Paul said earlier, our Grand Rounds have been better subscribed than ever. Our system has done these up in the upper right hand corner. There's a picture of uh, Laura Faris, also a physician. She's the president of uh, New York Presbyterian. She does a daily 10 o'clock uh, briefing uh, here. She's on with one of our infectious control experts. And uh, that goes out daily to a wide uh, berth of physicians and, and other healthcare workers in the system. I'd urge you that you have lots of audiences. And I think it's really terribly important to include as many as possible. Over the last few weeks, we've even brought patients and donors into the room uh, to that discussion. And I can't tell you what a resounding uh, uh, affirmation there's been uh, from that group as well, because they're just as curious and they're sick of watching CNN's repeating stories. So I think the messages have gone from sort of that education phase to the hawk stage that I talked about, to supportive and, and the, the psych and mental health aspects, uh, to a call to arms and now future focused. So then we, we started to bleed into phase one, and that's when, when everything uh, hit the fan, if you will. And <clears throat> we decided on a few principles as an organization. One was that we'd cover our departmental needs first. And so the, the dean and, and all the uh, faculty said, okay, you know, what, what is it gonna take to cover the emergent urgent needs uh, in-house within each department? Uh, but we also started booting up new services and creating new ideas. The idea, uh, I don't know how well you can see the, uh, the slide in the lower right-hand side, that's a huge uh, cough guard that uh, one of our technicians actually came up and, and uh, created uh, uh, at home in his shop. Uh, the first time I sat down at it, I felt like I was at a hockey game on the other side of the glass. Uh, the patient uh, was behind, but all these ideas, and, and you've seen them bleed across the country uh, as they've happened. But telemedicine, we've set up a triage system, uh, which we don't want to let erode. And there's a graph of the triage and, and how we did that to keep people out of the office that didn't have to come in. Uh, we set up conjunctivitis protocols. We, we did something with the emergency room that we've wanted to do forever, but a direct admit basically saying that a patient coming in with just an eye complaint with nothing similar in questioning and no fever, nothing similar to COVID in questioning and no fever, 
we have a direct path that they can come uh, to the Eye Institute, uh, which was unheard of three months ago. Uh, orthopedics is something very similar. We also have set up Epic. You know, we, we had just launched Epic uh, four or five weeks before, but we set up Epic pre-registration and pre-charting. So we tried to do a lot of stuff in that to take care of business at home, the core departmental things. We also were mandated, we, uh, we closed down research, in-house research, except for essential experiments and essential uh, animal research uh, about five weeks ago now. Um, one of our investigators, uh, Janet Sparrow, uh, correctly pointed out to me that research doesn't have to stop and that it can go on and she's still having team meetings like we're having now. Uh, but we also, as I said, quickly restarted Grand Rounds uh, after about a three week hiatus uh, and we got expert in teams and Zooms and, and uh, publishing. But then the question about redeployment came up and I, I'm sure that uh, you guys are dealing with this now and, and there's a lot to be talked about with redeployment. Let me tell you how we approached it. I don't, it's not the only way to do it, but it's, it's a way. So the, the dean uh, back uh, last month set up, actually that's a, a misnomer, it wasn't February 23rd, it was March 23rd, uh, set up a redeployment team. And my counterpart, uh, my administrative counterpart, uh, the CEO of the faculty practice and I co-chaired it. And we involved six chairs, we involved the dean of students and several dean's office members, the CFO, head of HR, and we've now redeployed about a thousand uh, physicians of our roughly 2,000. Uh, some inside their departments like medicine and OB, mainly were internal to the department, uh, but all others were external. We also redeployed uh, a couple hundred nurses, MPs, and, and PAs across the system. You know, the needs are, are some are obvious, the ICUs and the emergency rooms, the pop-up ICUs, but also things like fever clinics, uh, uh, work health, uh, workforce health and safety, uh, you know, went from a couple dozen calls a day to a thousand calls a day because uh, of people calling in. And so we tried to fairly direction uh, people to these various jobs. And we tried to take into consideration things like personal, fact, uh, personal factors, age, who you live with. Uh, you know, I, I quickly uh, learned that I had many more pregnant faculty members than I knew of. Uh, and, you know, and we just frankly didn't know. We didn't know uh, was that uh, a higher risk group. Remember H1M1 disproportionately affected uh, pregnant women. And so we didn't know heading into this. And so we, we had to try to make some sense out of that. But actually, one of the topics that we're going to do with the ethicist tomorrow night is about the ethics of redeployment uh, and just talk about that because it's on everybody's mind. But uh, we've redeployed all over the place. The, uh, the picture uh, uh, on the upper left is Royce Chen, our program director, and his daughter making him a name badge that said, hi, I'm a 12th year resident uh, that he's wearing on his chest in the emergency room ICU. Uh, one of our chief residents, uh, Horsha Serenek, is uh, there, and and uh, I even uh, stupidly or bravely took a rotation in an ICU. And thankfully, I had really smart uh, chief uh, resident and urology resident with me. We also, and actually, uh, uh, Jeff and colleagues did a lot of this. We rebuilt work health and safety. And there, you know, there. Look, incoming calls. This is an eight-hour shift. Uh, like I said, there were a few dozen a day, eight hours, 1,100. And, you know, the, these call weights were five hours before it was rebuilt. And so we did redirection to uh, less frontline uh, jobs, uh, but there's only so many of those. And so I don't have the right answer. Uh, we did it with some volunteerism. Uh, we did it with some cajoling. Uh, but I can tell you that every single department redeployed people uh, to frontline positions. Uh, and uh, I think actually the esprit de corps that it created was nothing, nothing short of amazing. I wanted to touch a sec on testing. 
because uh, I think there's this myth that if we just had enough testing, everything would be perfect. And I, I'm not sure that's true. And so Kevin Roth, the head of our uh, pathology and uh, testing laboratories, chair of uh, pathology, uh, helped me with a couple slides here. And I just wanted to give you a little timeline about the two testing uh, uh, for diagnostics, uh, PCR uh, antigen testing, virus testing, and then I'll talk a little bit about antibody testing. So back on the 1st of, uh, of March, we got approval from DOH to do the uh, uh, PCR testing. And within a week, we had a test that uh, was booted up. It could be small batch. We could only do about 60 a day. Uh, but we actually had the Roche, uh, the Roche platform we had in-house already. It was purely good fortune. We were the, actually the first uh, um, place in the country to boot up the Roche, which has now become pretty commonplace across the country. And it allowed us to go, so look, from the 1st of March to the 15th, two weeks, we went from uh, validating the test to actually being able to do 1,000 a day. Uh, we then started running into problems with reagent availability, but we had the capability and now the reagents and all and the, the packs are catching up. Uh, and now we can do uh, 1,000 a day. It's about a three hour turnaround. Uh, we've done 20,000 to date in the first six weeks, seven weeks. Um, and we actually booted up another platform because we're pre-testing uh, patients uh, for active COVID disease uh, with the PCR testing that has a rapid turnaround of about 45 minutes. It's not as scalable. But you know, over a month, uh, not even three weeks, we, we got those two platforms up and running. It did change some things. It didn't change everything. And frankly, for any of you that have tried to do any of this testing, either you've had it done yourself or you've actually swabbed somebody, uh, there's enough false negatives. In fact, one of our faculty members had two false negative tests, one with us and one externally. Uh, before having uh, positive antibodies, he was quite sick uh, subsequent and, and uh, then came back and had positive antibodies about three or four weeks later. It may be because of swabbing and just the collection. It may be actually virus load and titers. There's also something that we're running into and now we're seeing, and that is virus particles show up on these. Uh, these are highly sensitive. So even perhaps dead virus instead of reinfections maybe showing up three or four weeks later. So testing didn't solve everything. The other test that I mentioned, the serologic testing. Uh, so on the 30th of, of March, we got uh, approval uh, to do the, the serologic testing in-house. And this was largely David Ho and some basic science laboratories working with our, um, our pathology lab again. And they went from that two weeks later to being able to do something that initially was only 50% sensitive, they got it up to 93% sensitive and, and uh, uh, specificity of greater than 90%. And you probably have to be up in that range because the danger or the, the downside of false negatives is just so great. Uh, but uh, now that's been up and they're, they're almost fully automated. They're hoping that by next week, we'll be up to a uh, thousand a day. And then it, it starts to let us think about, do we test all healthcare workers? Can we find out who is probably uh, at least uh, um, immune protected to some extent? And, but those debates are going on right now. We're not there yet. We've only tested about 2000 people serologically uh, thus far. So uh, in a, uh, one of those town halls that we did last week, with the head of infectious disease, Magnus said, you know, when asked about you know, the question, if we only had testing, she said, you know, how to respond to these testing questions and the role of testing is not a simple one word answer or one sentence answer. It's really complicated because of all these things, availability and scalability, how quickly you can turn it around, the accuracy. And, you know, I think we all have to appreciate this and that a negative test may not be a negative test, that a positive test uh, with the PCR may be virus remnants. And, and so it, it's really confusing. Uh, we don't even know the timeline of the serology right now. And so 
I think our our school, and I think it's the mentality of Columbia, has has decided to take a fairly academic approach. It doesn't always meet with the real world of getting the test out there as quickly as possible. But I think a lot of these testing tents and all that were booted up six to eight weeks ago were were just wrong uh, and probably more misleading. Uh, but there's also a reassurance, and I get it. There's a, a PR and and how we're gonna. Uh, make people feel that uh, it's safe in our environment. So we're trying to play those against each other. But uh, the testing is is a lot more complicated than I ever would have guessed going into it. <clears throat> so now we're headed into phase two. And remember, phase two is COVID's in the air. We're going to have to deal with it. We have greater testing availability, and it continues to scale up. Uh, how are we going to approach this? And so we wrote a new set of guiding principles and they're the five things listed here. And uh, as I said, you know, we're seeing 10%, 15% of our normal visits and our normal surgery right now. Uh, that's a huge financial hit. The financial hit on the research side is not as big because the NIH has allowed us to pay uh, the personnel on those grants because they're presumably working at home and we're tracking all of that. So it's not as large, but you know, only about 50% of our, this is a, a, a budget circle uh, for the current year that we're in, that ends uh, the end of June, only about 50% of, of our departmental budget is, uh, is clinical. And so we have to only, or as much as, uh, is clinical, we have to rebound and we have to re regain a financial uh, footing. And so we've had a lot of the last couple of weeks, we've had sort of those come to Jesus talks with everybody in our, uh, from our division directors to our full faculty, to our research faculty, uh, et cetera. And, you know, I, I use the off the line, uh, I think it's a Druckerism, uh, that no margin, no mission. We can't meet the three missions if we don't get our clinical uh, footing back. And, and we want to cover all these uh, wonderful missions that are illustrated in the uh, pictures below. And I included the uh, one in the lower right because these are the, the 10 uh, PNS students that went out last year uh, into ophthalmology. And uh, I'm going to urge you all to. I realize that uh, we got hit really hard with this and our uh, students may not look as good to you because they didn't do as many ophthalmology rotations next year. Uh, be kind, take another look at them as we go forward. So I keep on saying that phase two is probably the most intellectually challenging and therefore hopefully the most rewarding, but it's a big stretch and it's a big sale, right? I, I, I'm becoming the salesman here a bit. But it's, it's a call to arms and everybody's been sitting at home ready, pent up uh, demand, pent up uh, work ethic, uh, but we have to get our footing back. So what I put out for our group is to say that if we go back to just what we were doing, we know that social distancing is gonna be in place for some period of time. So if we think we're gonna work nine to five, for the next whatever uh, months, and we're gonna have social distancing and less patients per hour and shorter visits, it means that we're gonna you know, may, maybe recapture two thirds, maybe three quarters, but that's not a formula for success. So if we return to the old status quo, to me, that's a failure. And, and so we've got to think about creatively how to to embrace this. Uh, as I said, the hospital has said, we're going back, we're, we're doubling down, we're gonna have increased capacity and we're gonna help you with that. We're gonna have more operating rooms. We're gonna figure this out. Uh, I think we fail if we just try to go back to business as normal. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Here's what, what the message is that, that our leadership group has been pushing out uh, to, our various uh, folks for the phase two preparation. And we, 
we're thinking about phase two is sort of mid-May through June, that's phase 2A, and then the rest of the summer, as I said, phase 2B. I put out the goal of being at 50% in-person visits by the end of June. Remember, we're at about 10% right now. And we talked a lot about leveling of the utilization of our fixed assets. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we had the luxury before that we had, you know, Thursday afternoon, academic half day. We don't have that luxury right now. We can't simply close up our uh, our clinics for a half day every week. We had the luxury that, you know, we didn't fully utilize our ORs on Fridays because nobody wanted to see post-ops on Saturdays. You know, now we're probably going to have to use our ORs Friday and Saturday. And so we've we have these very expensive fixed assets, whether they be space, ORs, clinic space, uh, equipment, and our personnel. And we've got to, you know, we were always geared up both from a nursing standpoint in the ORs, from a technician standpoint in our clinics for Wednesdays. Because everybody wants to, including myself, I've never operated on any other day but Wednesday. I get it, but we can't all have Wednesdays and we can't do, you know, 60 cases on Wednesdays and do 10 cases on Fridays and not do Saturdays. So we got to figure that out uh, amongst ourselves. And that's the challenge that I've put out to everybody. And so we've come up with a draft schedule. And in our mind, there's four schedules that interlink. We have a teaching clinic. I know some of you do. I know it's, it's antithetical to some places, but we have a teaching clinic. We have a faculty practice, we have OR blocks, and we have this, this new emergence of this triage telemedicine. And we've got to interlock those schedules to level the utilization across the board, but meet all those needs because they're all important to our, our missions. And so the way we approach this is we said, okay, every patient, so we, we canceled uh, in the first five weeks, we canceled about 6,500 outpatient visits in our department. We had every doctor go back through his or her uh, patient load. And we said, rank these A, B, or C. A is, has to be seen in May or June, presuming that the patients are gonna come back. Uh, B is, could be seen in July or August. C is, could be pushed out to September. So what could be a C? Uh, somebody that's coming in for a, a routine annual exam in July, you know, no disease, 10 years post cataract, whatever. Uh, what's uh, uh, gotta come in uh, in uh, the end of May? Uh, an unstable glaucoma, uh, a uh, partial traction, uh, peripheral traction attachment that's been being watched, you know, you know. And we, we simply asked them to do it. And it turned out that about 30% of those 6,500 initial uh, canceled were considered A's. 50% were B's and about 20% were C's. So then it led us back into the schedule. How many days, how many hours, how many patients can we get through? And we, we worked backwards to build the schedule and started saying to, you know, uh, Physician Smith, uh, you need, uh, to see, you said you needed this many A slots uh, for May or June. Uh, this is how many days you're gonna see patients. We'll do the same thing with the OR. And we've, we've gone through that same process uh, and uh, we'll do the same thing. Then we'll cover with the extra time, uh, the teaching clinic and the telemedicine triage. We're using it to do some financial forecasting to see how big a hole that uh, we have but we've also reminded uh, both our faculty and staff how lucky, frankly, we all are. And I, I think in our industry, we are lucky. Uh, and, and I think we all have to feel that. And we have plenty of staff, though, that, you know, they're worried about, do they have a job in the summer? Uh, will they live through this? Does their spouse have a job? Do they have coverage? Do they have childcare? Uh, as I said, mentioned earlier, there's food insecurity. And so, at least at the faculty level, we've over and over said, our goal here is to maintain employment of our faculty and staff 
and to have a robust return to do that. Our university uh, stepped up and said, we're going to keep you guys whole this year, this year ending June 30th. But we're going in with the mentality of next year, you know, we're gonna have to stand on our own. And so we need to rebuild it pretty quickly. This gets really complicated very quickly. You know, if you're gonna do epic uh, pre-authorization and how you do take a credit card online, uh, it's not a simple. And so the, the interdependencies become very critical. And I urge you to trial this a bit. So what we're doing right now is uh, uh, all of us are seeing a few more patients through May 18th uh, per day and figuring out, okay, where are the bottlenecks? What are the interdependencies? How, you know, how do we have a no touch uh, waiting room? We're thinking about having no waiting rooms. Can we do it? Can we figure that out? Do we have enough clinic space to do it? Do we have to see patients seven to seven, five days a week, seven to seven, six days a week? Do we have to operate five or six or seven days a week to catch up? And uh, so those are the, what we're going through, but we did it really based on that prioritization, uh, a conversation of how many patients we thought we had to get in, how many surgeries we thought we had to get in. So here's what I hope happens. I hope our clinical success is that trajectory up, and I don't know exactly when that happened, when we can get back. Partially it depends on the reemergences that we don't have that so-called W curve that people are fearful of. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we probably will have some hot spots going forward, hopefully with contract, contact tracing and, and testing, we'll keep uh, our uh, hands ar around that, uh, but, but who knows? But you know, I, I want by the end of the year to be back better than what we are. And uh, I'll, I'll propose how to do that. I put this line up here, uh, the green line, and it might not be completely obvious, but uh, this is uh, the, the mental stressor line. And I, I can't tell you how the, I actually created this a couple weeks ago, um, and it, it really pay, played off a few things. Within the centralized uh, revenue cycle office with the faculty practice, uh, which is about 250, 300 people, 28 people that work in that for me have had first degree relatives that have died. Um, you may have seen this article. Uh, this is one of our, uh, this is the mother and brother of uh, uh, the person who runs our health information uh, management systems. His mother and brother died on the same day at two separate hospitals in Queens. Um, and it was a front cover of the Post uh, a few weeks ago. And probably some of you read that uh, this past weekend, we actually had a suicide of a physician, of an ED physician uh, that went very public uh, happened on Sunday and, and went public over the last few days. You know, the green line before COVID, pre-COVID, it went up and down. We had a suicide on campus or we had a, a natural disaster. Uh, we had something happen financially. There were different stressors. But the escalation of the stress among every faction of our workforce, every individual, whether it be a resident, fellow, uh, junior or senior faculty member uh, is just, it's, it's off the charts. And so I'd, I'd urge you to think about this at your organizations. It's real, I don't think it's going away. And just like we have to increase and enhance capacity for everything else, we're gonna have to think about this. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done. We, uh, we have, uh, uh, a wonderful, uh, the New York uh, Psychiatric Hospital is attached to us. It's a huge department of uh, psychiatry. And we have a very close working relationship with the vice chair of, uh, of clinical uh, for them, a guy named Lou Baptiste. And actually at one of those town halls about a month ago, five weeks ago, uh, as we saw this, the, just the stress amongst our uh, faculty and staff increasing, 
actually Lou did one of those uh, uh, with me and it was a question and answer. It was wonderful and it, it you know, it was sort of group therapy, if you will, uh, but it was amazing. Uh, and since that time, he's done uh, another uh, dozen uh, town halls. Uh, they've done everything from group settings where they do groups of about 15 to 20 people. They've launched this thing called uh, Cope Columbia, uh, where it has everything from these group and town halls all the way down to one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and uh, this has been launched for the last month or so. Uh, you see that there's even been uh, one 19 one-on-one. -on -one. And he made the point the other day to me that, that of those one-on-one, -on -one, if somebody's reaching out one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it almost always leads to further referral to uh, other mental health services. We have to figure out how to enhance this service. Uh, it ain't going away. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that uh, some of your own uh, departments or institutions have booted something up, but uh, uh, at least in New York, I, I don't see it going away. And uh, this is, I, I pulled this off of uh, an email, but if you go to uh, the Columbia Doctors website, you can see the full uh, menu of services that uh, COPE Columbia has. and and uh, they're speaking about this nationally and uh, the chair of psychiatry is the immediate past chair of the American Psychiatric Association. So I think they have a pretty national voice, uh, but I, I think, uh, please, you know, the, the tragedy of this past weekend, you can't imagine, uh, this was a woman that's been on faculty for 15 years, took her own life on Sunday. She ran uh, one of our small hospital emergency rooms which was hit very hard. Um, and so I, I, I urge you to sort of get involved with this one. <coughs> Excuse me. So a lot of, lot of lines, a lot of uh, stuff going on through these first uh, couple phases. Let me touch on a couple closing remarks and then I'll open up for questions. I'd urge you to think about some good coming out of this. And there's good like, me working out again and watching CNN for my report up in the upper right hand corner. But there's the good of, uh, I took a picture of our dinner table. You know, all of a sudden my two kids are home. I'm not sure they're that excited about it, but you know, they're stuck with us. And so we get to eat as a foursome every night. Uh, the good is this is Ellie, Ellie Mang, uh, one of our chief's uh, baby who was born this past weekend. There are a lot of good things happening. And I'd urge you to celebrate some of these small successes uh, and, you know, whether it be flattening the curve or when you get over the hump or when discharges uh, exceed admissions, uh, celebrating the, the person who made the, uh, the, the big screen for the slit lamp, uh, celebrating whatever. Uh, and, you know, even here, I get to work out with my, uh, 21 year old son, not such a bad deal. So I'm taking selfies, he's working out. This is, you know, the, I'm sure this is going on in Chicago right now. The seven o'clock uh, cheering is on the upper west side. It, it's magnificent. It really uh, it is meaningful. And the, the chair of orthopedics sent me the real heroes wear scrubs. I think it's palpable. And, the, you know, we all know that there's been some erosion over the past couple decades of sort of embracing and the respect for physicians and caregivers. I, I it's at a now time high, so I urge us all to embrace that. But there's other dividends. You know, telemedicine, this is a graph for Columbia Physicians. We were seeing about 7,000 patients a day. Uh, we see about a million and a half patient visits a year. And you see that dropped off. That's that clinical drop off uh, the second and third week of, of March. Uh, the green line. And then you see the, the blue line is the total visits and the orange line are televisits that came on board. And actually the orange line has exceeded for about the last month, the number of visits that uh, uh, we're doing in person. And they're making right now, it's making up between 60 and 70% of our visits. It's not true for ophthalmology, but the teletriage, I don't think should ever go away. It's something we're gonna work in. That red eye clinic of the, they're trying to differentiate the red eye 
that is the itchy burny seasonal allergy can probably be done on televisits, probably safely. We're thinking about some post-op visits. Why not? You know, do we have to see every post-op visit in person? Certainly plastics probably doesn't. And I, I, I'd submit to you that a number of others don't. This direct to, to ophthalmology from the ED, cross-training of our staff, the fixed asset utilization, uh, we can't let it go away. We can't waste those dollars anymore. Um, the conference that we're doing right now, uh, using Zoom and Teams and the telelearning, uh, we have a virtual morning report now uh, uh, for our residents, and it's better attended to, than ever. Uh, you know, rarely did more than one or two attendings go to morning report. Now there's a dozen every morning. Uh, streamlining visits. Uh, how can we imagine a low-touch uh, visit profile where the, the patient, imagine this, they pre-register uh, on your electronic medical record, a technician calls them the night before, and does the uh, HPI, updates their medications. So they come in, they walk into your imaging suite, they then go into a room to see you, and they're out in 20 minutes. You know, it's just, there's no reason we can't do that. Uh, or maybe they come in for a, a diagnostic uh, appointment, and uh, you know, for ophthalmology or for uh, glaucoma, they get a rebound tonometry, uh, an OCT, an anterior segment photograph, and uh, maybe a visual field, maybe not. They go home and then Dr. Liebman does a televisit with them the next day with all that information in hand. Yeah, I think we have to think about making something good of this. And all of, some of those ideas were right away. I don't think the telemedicine idea is gonna go away. We needed something to force patients to accept it. And I think this did. And I, I don't think it's going to go away in the short term, but shame on us if we let it go away, the positive effects on, of it go away in the long term. Phase three planning. Uh, you, know you're, you, you know there's a lot of unknown when uh, places like uh, Accentra and consultants start sending you uh, brochures, very glossy brochures on how to prepare for the post-COVID world. And you know this. Uh, uh, came to me a, a week or two ago. I, I think it's too early to tell. We're sort of starting to think about, okay, do we need a, a set of guiding principles for what we anticipate in the fall? But back to what the dean said to me, don't, don't get ahead of yourself. Let's figure out phase 2A and phase 2B. We just shouldn't go, go backwards. There's too little knowing, you know. Uh, the, the market, like the remdesivir uh, report today, but if you read the report, there's almost no information in it. And uh, uh, you know, just like it liked uh, hydroxychloroquine a month ago uh, for, for no good reason. So there's too many unknowns about effective therapy and immunity, vaccines, reemergence, et cetera, to really do meaningful phase three planning. But it's, it's gonna have to start uh, sometime in the next probably uh, six to eight weeks. So let me close with what keeps me awake at night. I will tell you it's evolved over time. It was figuring out how to adequately PPE our, our workforce because at that first Wuhan uh, meeting, uh, when we heard the, uh, the reports out of Wuhan and read the reports, we realized that ophthalmology is at a disproportionate risk. Uh, Royce Chen, our program director, has a great paper that's uh, uh, about to come out, or maybe it's in preprint right now, uh, showing that uh, uh, anesthesia, um, ED, and ophthalmology are, are probably disproportionately affected by this. So that's what was keeping me up at night. Then it was ventilators and beds. Do we have enough doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists? But that shifted over time. And really what kept me up next was, are we gonna be able to pay everybody? Do we have to lay off half of our workforce? Do we have to furlough? Um, what will keep me up in the future? Uh, probably tonight. Uh, you know, phase three planning. How do we uh, how do we embrace that? Will the patients come back? How do we project to them that we're safe? That we've created a safe environment? How do we have uh, relatively COVID-free zones? Can we have relatively uh, COVID-free zones? Uh, you know, and are we going to have a deep, long recession? Uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm not enough of a pundit to tell you that, or we're gonna have some recession and how that affects our, our workforce, uh, uh, how that affects our payer mix and, and such. Uh, there's a lot of fear of unknown. I think it's shifted over time. Uh, I don't think any of these are insurmountable. Uh, we, just like we checked off the PPE issue uh, weeks ago and we keep a constant monitor on it, we'll get through these. Uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate uh, the interest, uh, the notion that I'd be giving an ID related uh, discussion to Chicago uh, teaching programs uh, three months ago was as foreign to me as, as COVID was. Uh, but uh, I think we'll get through this together. I think uh, the nationwide learning that's gone on has been nothing short of amazing. And uh, we need to take some next steps. So I'm happy to answer questions and appreciate your attention. Uh, Dr. Jack, great talk. Um, great site. You know, I think that was very helpful. I mean, we, as a as a as a city, you know, we we all sort of meet on Thursday evenings, and you know, I think that mm -hmm. you know, obviously, Chicago is not quite at the same place as New York is, um, and you know, you've had a lot of challenges. I, I'm curious. Um, so, first off, ground rules for the next thirty minutes. Uh, if you can just use your uh, raise hand function. Um, or if you want to just type in a question, I can, I can get to that and, and we'll call on people accordingly. Um, in terms of the physician group, you know, I'm curious because you, you're the president of that group. What, you know, maybe high level sort of uh, short term, long term strategy, right, in terms of what you're doing with, uh, with things after, after June 30th? So, <clears throat> you know, so the hospital uh, and, and the school, frankly, we're both in a, a good cash position going into this. And we used to joke about the hospital being in a cash position that they were in. Um, now it's uh, come to be a, a real benefit. Uh, and the school, uh, both, you know, our parent hospital, for those that don't know New York, is New York Presbyterian. And it's the, it's eight hospitals, it's a huge system but it's the parent hospital of both us and Cornell. So there's two medical schools uh, and two faculty practices and a, a, a mega system. And, and they're all financially strong. And so we collectively made the decision that we're gonna grow out of this, not contract out of this. But all that's gotta be kept, uh, you know, there's a reality check there and can we sustain a 90% hit next year? No, we can't. It's just, and so, you know, the 50% by the end of June uh, means to me that we can get to 100% or more by the end of the year. And our systems uh, have bought into, we'll help backstop that. But we're going to have to be, we're going to have to be frugal. We're going to have to be, ambitious we're going to have to be hard working we're going to have to level those utilization of assets we're going to have to do our part i believe and then the the hospital and the uh, med schools will do their part um that's not the same every place you know you guys all saw that the mayo which you know they don't make their money on rochester minnesota they make their money on people flying in when people can't fly in um they furloughed people and lots of systems, lots of departments have furloughed lots of people. We're gonna have to probably contract. We do have a hiring freeze. There's a university-wide hiring freeze. And uh, if, if it wasn't a committed, there's exceptions to hiring freeze are committed before the beginning of COVID. And uh, it has to uh, pay for itself, essentially. It's gotta be a revenue producing. Uh, so it can be an investigator who's funded. It can be a, uh, um, a clinician uh, who's gonna get up and running and add, we're gonna build out of this, but uh, a, an unfunded junior uh, scientist right now, there's just no, nobody's gonna be taking the risk on that. If the NIH comes back with a huge stimulus like an era, then, then maybe. Um, but uh, I think we do have some financial might, but. I believe every department's gonna have to do exactly what I laid out. And that's sort of the mantra that I've been 
uh, chirping uh, across the system. Thanks. Um, any, any questions for Dr. Chaffee? There's, there's a couple in the chat thing there. Yeah, here we go. Let's see. Tele-ophthalmology can, it says tele-ophthalmology can we do at clinic from the desk to the patient? So, so here's, uh, we'll tell you, you, you all know that the, the tele-ophthalmology or telemedicine uh, regulations got relaxed extensively. The biggest thing that happened for us because of the tri-state area and because there's, there's so much traffic between uh, Connecticut, uh, New York, and New Jersey, is that those borders went away. So I can do a televisit of somebody in New Jersey, even though I don't have a New Jersey license. So that was a, a big get. Is that going to erode back? I would imagine it is, but if, if televisits are, are, um, are productive, uh, then it means that, you know, I'll be getting a license in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, so, so that's the first. The, the second is that uh, uh, I keep on saying, thank goodness we put Epic in on uh, February 1st, not March 1st. It would have been a disaster because uh, we were still learning. But it's, uh, we had bought all the modules, including the uh, uh, virtual visit module. Uh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, and uh, it's done on, on your cell phone, uh, their, their cell phone app called Haiku, uh, and you're talking to the patient. And at the same time, you can be in the record uh, typing a note or uh, doing things. Do I think tele-ophthalmology is gonna have, is gonna be the end all be all? No. But telederm, uh, telemental health, um, tele-primary care are gonna be big. Uh, our, our primary care right now is something like 90% tele. The derm is the same way. They're about 90% uh, because they can, um, and there's enough information. Right now, I think it's going to be a little niche, but stuff like the triage clinic, I think that's a natural extension of it. So I think we can use uh, tele-ophthalmology. <clears throat> Without physically seeing the patient, it has its limitations. But you know, maybe this means uh, somebody really smart figures out how to let the person's iPhone take a better anterior segment photo uh, or a posterior segment photo um, and such. So there's another one about uh, models for pre-COVID testing before elective surgery. That's a great one. So we're working through that right now, and um, so. We actually, and you may have seen some of this in the press, we had a weekend about a month ago where on our OB service, uh, two patients who had touched each about 20 caregivers, both while in their stay, one was a, a pregnant mom who was in for about a week and a half pre-delivery, the other was, was just in for a, a two or three day uh, normal uh, course delivery both turned COVID positive with symptoms during their stay. But that was after they had touched lots of people. Um, and, and OB, the, there was a huge toll, especially on nursing in OB. Uh, and it, it made us ratchet down a lot of things. So one is we started testing everybody, uh, every uh, pregnant mom coming in. We actually, as a city, went to uh, know a partner uh, in with uh, the delivering uh, mother uh, that had a lot of understandable pushback. The governor ended up reversing that after a couple weeks, but they were so freaked out because so many people on that, but it started to, uh, were exposed uh, during that time. And it, it uh, started to teach us something about testing. And what it taught us first was about 30% of the mothers coming in asymptomatic were positive in that first tranche. And so it, it let us wrap our head around a lot of COVID positivity out in the community. And it goes back to David Ho's work that there were tens of thousands of people in January and February in New York City that were positive. They just weren't uh, being diagnosed as COVID. 
Second is it, it got us thinking about, okay, who do we test? And so for uh, several weeks now, we've been testing everybody um, that uh, is coming in. It really doesn't have a huge effect on whether or not we're gonna do the case. It may have an effect on whether or not, uh, you know, we try to avoid aerosolizing procedures like general anesthesia and there's protocols for who's in the room now, how uh, in a COVID positive patient, how they're intubated and such. And, you know, it, it may push you to saying, let's wait a few weeks till you're well. One of the cases for the ethicist tomorrow is about the risk of exposing with uh, an OR staff to a COVID positive uh, patient. What about the risk of having them having surgery and then uh, going into full-fledged uh, uh, COVID disease uh, during their uh, post-operative course from, from a, a retinal detachment surgery with a bubble in their eye or whatever. You can imagine how, how quickly it would get complicated. So we are testing everybody. We're trying to boot it up to test everybody with the PCR testing uh, diagnostic. We haven't got to the state where we're quick enough with it uh, to uh, test everybody so that by the time they're uh, going to the OR that we have the results, but that's the ultimate goal. We will test everybody uh, going forward. It also may let you, once the antibody testing is more prevalent in the community, it, it would let you test patients ahead of time. And if you're uh, antibody positive, perhaps you're the first case. Uh, and we can wait on the second or third case of the day uh, to see if they're uh, COVID positive with PCR. So Jack, that's, just, uh, that's our strategy, yeah. There's a private question um, that what didn't get to you, but it, it sort of segues on the, uh, the surgical piece, but about PPE in the OR and what PPEs you're using and how do you actually uh, have this discussion with the hospital about supplying the, the, the surgeons with enough PPE? So, you know, we, we were PPE crippled uh, going into this and it was everything we did for that first couple of weeks was seemed to be related to PPE and then to making sure we had enough ventilators. And we've been fortunate to up our supplies of PPE uh, and we're con constantly doing projections of how much PPE uh, we're going to utilize and what the burn rate is. And it's, it's multiples, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 times to more, maybe 20 times as we boot up uh, compared to what we used to use. Uh, we are operating with N95s. Uh, everybody in the hospital, as I said earlier, no matter uh, where they're at, is uh, wearing a, a regular surgical mask. And uh, that's our approach for now. Uh, general anesthesia, as I said, there's protocols around who's in the room with intubation and extubation. Uh, I'm uh, thankful that I, I do about one general anesthesia every five years. Uh, and so I try to avoid it. We had a, uh, uh, a terrible uh, perforated ulcer, ruptured globe, blind eye uh, this past week. And uh, they were talking about enucleation and they were talking about general anesthesia. Uh, we had long discussions about avoiding general anesthesia. Um, I'm doing a patient, actually a physician tomorrow. I'm doing a, uh, uh, a ciliary body destructive procedure, which I'm gonna do in the office uh, as not to, to take off the OR. So trying to avoid the OR when we can. Uh, using N95s, I wouldn't operate right now with NN95. And uh, uh, those are sort of the precautions we have in place. Um, there's a question here about how many patients per day. What we're saying right now, you know, <laughs> I think Dr. Liebman's still online. He has sort of a large clinic. Um, and, uh, but we fully recognize that we're not going back to 80 or 90 patients days uh, anytime soon. So what we're saying right now is four patients per hour max per physician. They go right to the rooms. They, they don't leave the rooms except for testing. Um, and uh, for a new patient, we're doubling that. We're, we're having a 30-minute a uh, block time. And uh, 
that's how we're going to approach the next uh, two months. And then we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the flow is. We'll see how we handle it. Uh, but I don't see it quickly going back. So we're going to have to stretch our days uh, for the high volume for uh, the anterior segments for our cornea uh, division, anterior segment, our cataract surgeons, our retina specialist, our glaucoma specialist. Um, it, it's uh, uh, probably the highest we can get. And then we have, you know, Brian Marr, our ocular oncologist, another special, lots of testing, lots of imaging. We're trying to figure, walk through those, but sort of that's the four max per doc. Uh, and that lets uh, he or she have uh, uh, about eight rooms. Actually, we're expanding the room use and uh, um, that's how we're handling it. Uh, there's lots here, let's see. Uh, public health numbers of COVID cases need to level off or go down before starting to go back to normal clinic volumes. So, you know, that's that phase three that I talk about. <clears throat> I just think, uh, I think it depends on, you know, does this 30%, I, I'll tell you a story, a personal story. Um, my mother lives in an assisted living uh, facility here in Scarsdale and um, uh, they had DOH come in. You all know the stories about, uh, it's not a nursing home, but it, you know, it's assisted living apartments and DOH came in and tested two weeks ago and 53% were positive. Um, and that's asymptomatic. And over the first two weeks, one, and this is a, a place that has about 400 residents. So a couple hundred patients were positive. One became symptomatic over the first two weeks. So I think this is out there a lot more than we think. And with that, I hope that some herd immunity begins to emerge. I hope that, you know, uh, I'm not convinced that remdesivir is the answer, but I hope that one of these therapeutics, uh, there's an amazing, I was on with uh, David Goldstein, who runs our genomics division this morning. Uh, there's amazing, you know, every place is seeing that about the, the breakdown of male to female is about 60-40 with this, and we don't understand why. And, and there, there's something about uh, hormonal uh, uh, receptor regulation. And, and so they're, they're starting to look at in very sick men uh, about some of the uh, drugs that they use for uh, uh, prostate uh, uh, cancer, uh, about uh, downregulating uh, uh, antigens. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I think it's going to play out. I don't have a prediction for you of when it's going to play out. There's just too many unknowns, but I don't see normal. I don't see normal returning for the next, at least in New York for the next year, two. You know, if we get a, things could change. If we really do get a vaccine that works and we do have some herd immunity that could change very quickly. How are you spacing visual fields? You know, actually, uh, Jeff and I made the decision right from the beginning that we, we haven't done a visual field, save very few, uh, since the middle of March. And here was our rationale. The visual field bowl is probably the best COVID spreader on the planet. You have a patient breathing into that thing for uh, a uh, half hour. Um, and how do you space that out? How do you sterilize it? Can you wipe it down? Uh, you know, these bowls aren't that durable and, uh, and the, the coating, the internal coating is, is fairly finicky. And so we just stopped doing all visual fields and it forced us to ask the question, you know, it, could we practice glaucoma without a visual field? Uh, now we are doing some and, and obviously in neuro-ophthalmology and others, we, we need visual fields, but we really crunch down on it and we don't have a good answer for you. We will do some visual fields, but I think you gotta be really careful about spacing them out. We did shut it down when it was pre having enough PPE when we were all struggling even to have basic surgical masks. Now everybody having a mask, it probably lends a different level of, uh, of protection, but I, it's a great question, one that we don't have convincingly, completely answered, but I would urge you to space them out. Uh, you know, time and the 
the virus falling to the ground. You've probably read about ORs and all, um, but in a non-humidified space, such as a clinic, I'd, I'd just be very careful with visual fields. We, we just made that decision. And uh, as I said, we, we became hawks really quickly. Um, UV sterilization. So it's an interesting question. There's a guy named David Brenner, uh, Ian Lipton, uh, both of which have some national prominence here uh, around uh, various uh, uh, UV sterilization techniques, various bandwidths. Uh, we don't have that answer yet. As you can imagine, I, I was on that same call with Goldstein this morning. Uh, David Brenner was on and getting the light bulbs for these UV uh, sterilizers has become near impossible. And I'm sure there'll be a shortage of those. Um, and so I think it's actually, I think it may have a place, maybe in the ORs, maybe with equipment. Uh, I don't know the answer uh, yet, but it, it, it's a great question. We are thinking about it both as a system. We're also, you know, early on when we weren't getting PPE, we have all sorts of protocols set up around, and I'm sure you guys do too, around sterilizing masks uh, with UV, with heat, with autoclaving, et cetera. And so we've spent a lot of time with our, our UV experts in the last uh, uh, two months. I think it's gonna have a place uh, because it's a, a quick uh, way of, uh, uh, of killing the virus. Let's see if I can go back to a few of these questions. Um, there's one about um, patient messaging. You know, how do you message? Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, so actually, uh, remarkably, and I, this is uh, uh, new this morning. Uh, uh, Paul was in New York for a long time. He knows that uh, uh, the systems uh, uh, don't have any love for each other, uh, and uh, there's all sorts of silly uh, uh, competition. But uh, the systems realize that uh, uh, that there's going to be some convincing to portray Manhattan as a safe environment uh, because of uh, uh, of it being an epicenter, and especially if you go to the micro epicenters of whether it be the Bronx or or Queens or out on Long Island now up in Westchester, and so they realize that there's a collective uh, they have to tell the story uh, and they're gonna tell it collectively over the next month uh, to begin with. And not that they're not all gonna uh, then uh, um, try to portray themselves as the, the best uh, and, and that will happen quickly on its heels. But I think we all understand that we have to message out and it has to be honest messaging. We're having that discussion at a, uh, a faculty practice level also of how we, uh, we message out. And so some of the initial messaging is meant about, hey, we can contact you with uh, telemedicine. And I gotta tell you that uh, I've done some of the televisits myself and some of them had some value medically. They all had some value psychologically uh, for the patients. And so I, it was on one of the slides I will tell you that uh, we took that list of 6,500 of those initial patients bumped out. And about a month ago, I said to our technical staff, I'd like you to call every single person on the list and just say, hey, we're thinking about you. Is there anything I can do for you? And I, you wouldn't believe, I, you know, we say, can you do this over a two or three week period? Uh, in the first week, they had done something like 4,000 calls and made 4,000 contacts and, and wonderful stories come back and the patients loved it. I think frankly, the technicians loved it uh, because a lot of them were sitting on their hands waiting for something to do. And, uh, and so they've contacted every single patient that we uh, uh, had to postpone. And so I think keeping in contact for surgical cases that we postponed, we're actually pushing that back to the physicians. Uh, we're going to have our physicians contact, and a number of them already have. Uh, they've stayed in contact, uh, but uh, especially for the more elective procedures, uh, we realize that they're in jeopardy, and uh, so we've uh, gone all the way back to the physicians. 
uh, about that. It, it's a, gonna be a collective that we're all gonna have to grapple with. Um, and it, it's been all over the map. Uh, it seems some patients you call and they're ready to come in. Other patients are very hesitant. And I, I was on with our head of ortho today and, and uh, I think I told the story that he said that even similar procedures, you know, total hip waiting to be done. Uh, some patients were raring to go, other patients weren't. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to tell the story. Uh, we're good at handling droplet precautions. We just have to do it and uh, uh, have to have uh, safety. We have to sell that uh, safety profile. I think, I think what we'll come back first, obviously, is are the things that are more urgent. Mm -hmm. Policies for testing staff and physicians. So um, uh, we've been struggling with this a lot, mainly because of availability and wanting to do, you know, if you, if you test everybody, uh, uh, test them uh, for the virus uh, with PCR, you test them today, you don't know if they're exposed tonight at dinner uh, and uh, uh, if they have it tomorrow. But there is some reassurance. Uh, starting next week, we'll have both antibody, uh, that platform will be booted up to, to do a thousand or more a day. And uh, at that point, we are gonna first PCR uh, all the physicians uh, starting next week. But there's been a big push to do this in a, uh, a scientifically sound way to try to get more information around uh, when the antibodies uh, appear, over what course, can you get reinfected, et cetera. And so uh, we are gonna test everybody starting next Monday. One more question, but do public health numbers of COVID cases need to level off or go down zero or negative slopes before going to I think what she means phase is the two, in the phase two. So we, you know, we kept on climbing for so long that uh, we were worried. We were still worried that we had enough ICU beds and enough ventilators. Uh, we were still in that phase as it kept on climbing. So, and then we saw that you saw the break uh, in the curve. And uh, when that happened uh, and it started to flatten out, and then we saw the flattening of the um, ICU and ventilator use. And then the, uh, uh, in, you know, within a few days, the numbers started going down uh, for total uh, COVID patients being admitted. The, you've, you've seen uh, the national and, and regional numbers. So I do think you gotta get to that break point to make sure just that your system's not gonna be overwhelmed. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's when we started to do real phase two planning. And that's really just been over the last two weeks. Yeah, it's interesting. I think for, for a lot of us too, you know, obviously we're not having the same volume or you know, the same peak. We're looking at ICU capacity as well as number of cases and, you know, can our system, you know, tolerate it? It's not, it's not just about the numbers. It's whether or not your system can actually manage the number of patients that you need to to treat, you know, with ventilators and ICU beds. Exactly. Um, I, one last question. I'll let you go. Sorry. Resident fellow education. That's a, yeah, that's a great. Yeah. Actually, so uh, we actually have been talking a lot about that um, for all the obvious reasons, you know, uh, uh, we joke that our, our poor glaucoma fellows, this, they had to live through, Dr. Liebman and I going through an epic launch and uh, then uh, uh, now COVID. And it is a big hit. So what did we do? We really doubled down uh, on, on the academic side, the uh, um, didactics, uh, spending time that we wouldn't probably have spent uh, with these folks. Uh, earlier today, there was a, uh, a COVID-related uh, journal club that uh, Tungulp Dazelle ran. Uh, the, uh, Jeff and Gusta Moraes uh, started a, uh, a glaucoma case conference, and now every division has a, a weekly case conference uh, with the residents and fellows uh, for that. 
So we are trying to replace some of what they've lost, but there's no doubt that they've lost uh, stuff by not seeing the patient volumes. We're less worried, frankly, as a system. Uh, you know, New York Presbyterian is the largest uh, residency program in the country. It's over 2,000 residents uh, because it's both us and Cornell. And we're less worried as a system about the graduates that are about to graduate in June because most of them have met their, their minimums and many, many of them have, have flown past uh, their minimums. We're more worried about next year's. Uh, will they, you know, if this goes on and surgical volumes are way down for ophthalmology for uh, six months, uh, will they get to their minimums? And uh, how will they get to their minimums? How do they just see enough ophthalmic patient visits uh, and so that they have exposure uh, to all the, uh, the rare and wonderful things that we see? So I think it's a real question for next year, and we're going to have to struggle with it. But it's a nationwide uh, phenomenon. And besides infectious disease, I think it's a phenomenon that's going to affect every specialty. I'll close with this. This is a good closing. You know, I grew up in uh, uh, medicine in the 80s. And I remember sitting in morning report as a medical student when the first, uh, at a VA, when the first case of uh, AIDS in that uh, uh, VA was described, we had no idea what it was. And, and then over my uh, training, you know, it was defined and my, during my ophthalmology training, uh, we saw lots and lots of AIDS patients. Uh, and the minute uh, they had uh, CMV retinitis, we knew they were dead within uh, a month, but we were constantly monitoring them. And, um, and it was before any of the, uh, uh, the drug cocktails uh, were even thought of. I'd submit to you that they're learning something that during this time about resilience and about how to handle adversity and about redeployment and about teamwork. And, and so I would take a slightly different approach. They might not do as many cataract surgeries, but I think there's some invaluable lessons, and I keep on trying to stress that to them, that they're going to carry with them for their whole career. And so there is, it's one of those good things, I think. And I, I think, and I'm not trying to sell that. I, I'm really not. I, I truly believe it. I am a better doctor because I held the hand of a, an AIDS patient who, you know, uh, we saw for the first time with uh, CMV and, and they knew the, the story from then on. And so I, I think we've got to take that and just, uh, it is what it is. Uh, none of us thought we were ever going to deal with this and they're learning something that uh, many of us uh, uh, have practiced for decades and, and never got to learn. So that's, it. that's how I'd close. I think there are some positives from this. Jack, thanks so much. Um, I think we all appreciate it. I, I, I miss you. <laughs> uh, come visit anytime, Paul, once the airports reopen. Yeah, exactly. you know, look, I, I really, uh, I wish you well as you, you venture into this. And I would just urge you, uh, there's stuff on our website. You can borrow whatever you want. If there's anything I said that you didn't understand, reach out to us. Uh, we really took the approach right off the bat that as we thought of things, we're just going to push them out. Uh, yeah. because. Uh, uh, we just, uh, the, the tsunami that we went into, we didn't want others going into as ill-prepared. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.